Warning, this episode contains foul language and somewhat graphic descriptions. for all things strange, unusual, paranormal, supernatural, creepy, sticky, gross, scary, and everything in between. Each week in this brave new world of ours, we get to sit down and chat with each other via the internet. That's right, it's the future, and I can see Lauren, and we can record a conversation from miles and miles away. Can you believe it? Technology. My name is Ashley, and this is my co-host Lauren. Hi, weirdos. <laughs> and this week, we're going to go back in time. To the Ooh. misty meadows of Ireland, the rocky shores of Greece, and also the misty meadows of Ireland and more of Greece. <laughs> it turns out we're just going to Ireland and Greece, but it's because these countries are old as dirt and filled with history and magic, which is perfect because today we're going to be talking about mythological creatures. Woohoo! Ashley, that was a beautiful intro. Thank you. I tried really hard. It was so funny because I texted Lauren the other day because I was trying to write the intro and I was like, ooh, the misty meadows of Ireland and the rocky shores of Greece. And I was like, hey, where are your mythological creatures from? And she was like, <laughs> Ireland and Greece. I was like, ah, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, well, cool. now I have some comedy Great. in my intro because we both have them. We are in the same places. But yeah, it's because those places are so old. They are, and they, honestly, they just have the best creatures, yeah. so that, it is what it is. They're so old, and so even excited. even the places in uh, newer countries like the United States of America, you know, we have mythological creatures, but most of them are based on creatures of the past. Like, there no, there's no original mythological creatures that I know of. Ooh, listeners, write in if you have an original yeah, mythological creature. I can't think of one. Yeah, because... Honestly, I think ours just take off of what other countries mm -hmm. do and they kind of like form their own new creature, but it is all stolen ideas yeah. for the most part. I mean, even I remember specifically when we talked to, um, when we did the episode that no one can um, speak the name of because it's not in English with <laughs> Mel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when we right. did sort of like other countries' haunts. She would, you know, we would bring up these things. It was like, that sounds like blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, here's why. <laughs> it came from why. Iran. It's, it's from them. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so how are you doing? Um, mostly fine. Okay. I, I love being honest with our weirdos, though. Today was a tougher day. And to any of the mamas out there, you'll feel me. It was just, it was a tough day being a mom. It wasn't necessarily mental health as a whole taking a toll. It was just a lot of frustration with my son, even though Wilder is normally so sweet and the cutest. He was just having a day. He was a little clingy, um, wanted to be held all day, and he's 22 pounds now, so he's real heavy <laughs> to hold and walk around. And uh, yeah, I just didn't get a lot done for myself, and I was trying to do some last-minute stuff for the podcast for tonight and just try to live my life. So it was a little bit of a frustrating day. So I'm actually so happy to be here right now <laughs> talking to you, honestly, because I feel like I'm doing an adult normal thing just for myself. I round two, have a glass of wine next to me. And, and today I Wilder need it. is asleep. <laughs> yes, I really needed it today. And Wilder is asleep and all is right in the world. Good. So yeah, just kind of a frustrating day. But how are you? Um, I'm doing well. I feel like I stumbled upon something really wonderful, and that is every season of Unsolved Mysteries on Amazon Prime. Oh my gosh, I saw that you were watching that, yeah. and I'm obsessed. Um, are you just loving amazing. every minute of it? I am loving every minute of it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, it's so good. It's all like uh, early 90s reenactments, right? Oh, Isn't yeah. That, like... Which is part of its charm. <laughs> like the thing is, yes. is that every and, and it's I'm surprised because so many people have reached out to me like, what is this show? And I'm like, what is what do you mean? What is this show? It's Unsolved Mysteries. How do they not know? It's Unsolved Mysteries. Yes. It's been on, you know, it was it's from the night. Everyone knows the show, but a lot of people don't. So if you are one of those people, it's basically a show about unsolved mysteries but it's everything there's uh you know unsolved murders there's missing persons there's like people trying to get reunited with their long lost loves or their long lost uh children or parents um it's ghosts it's ufos it's like you know db cooper was an episode we just watched recently they did the queen mary like everything I mean, so, so a lot of the great. stuff you will remember of about, you know, something that we and me and Lauren talked about on the show. Like there's so, so many things say. that pop up and I'm like, we talked about this and I get so excited. Right. Oh, my gosh. I haven't watched as much as you. I, I can see that you were binging oh, a man. lot of it, but I've watched a little and every episode is so good to me. Like, I love the cheesy reenactments. The stories are amazing like there are some stories that i i just can't believe even happened and i need to know the answer so it's really fun and for some reason i don't find the reenactments in this show cheesier than a lot of other shows like this oh my gosh yeah a lot of shows do it way worse hands down i just i feel like the the actors are a little bit better and also something that's yeah. cool about the show is they actually have the people and the police and like whoever who were involved in the crime or maybe not crime, but involved in the story, they'll act in their own reenactments. So that's kind of cool, too. Oh, that's so cool. But, I um, love that. It's great. It's really wonderful. There are, I think, nine seasons of the original series on Amazon Prime. And then they rebooted the series um, with Dennis Ferrini. F- Fer- I don't remember how to pronounce his last name, but. Ferigne? Ferigne? It doesn't matter. Sure. I'll believe you. <laughs> Dennis F. <laughs> they rebooted the series, so all of those are on there. And, surprise, surprise, Netflix is rebooting it this year, and it's going to, As they're going to have they a series on, on Netflix at some point. So, you better do it, Netflix. You better do it. You it. better I do like it that. right, guys. That's exactly correct. Um, that's so much fun, though. I'm glad you've stumbled upon that, and it's bringing you joy because. Honestly, you just, you, that's what you got to do in this time. Find some. It also, Find it brings to bring me joy for a different reason too. Because And Joe, me and Joe have like the same connection to it. It reminds us of our grandparents because we always watched it with our grandparents. Oh, see, that melts my heart. I love yeah, that. Yeah, ever we would watch, uh, Joe and I both like obviously separate from each other we didn't meet meet until uh we were in our late 20s <laughs> but uh you know we would watch uh unsolved mysteries would come on and then america's most wanted would come on which is another oh, great I show i freaking love america's most wanted <laughs> and then, I, we are in agreement after there. that cops would come on what you gonna do what you gonna, what you gonna do, do when they come you boys. bad boys bad bo- oh um so yeah, cops is the best yeah so that was a really really great night of television i always loved staying the night at my grandparents house on the nights that that was you the you got programming the yeah <laughs> i love it so much also, I haven't watched it yet, but Netflix gave us the gift of a new episode of Tiger King, yeah. kind of a reunion of sorts, and I still mm-hmm. need to watch it, but I heard it's pretty great. I also Very haven't excited. watched it. That's funny that we neither of us have watched it yet, because you'd think I know. that- I was kind of hoping you'd give me feedback. <laughs> No. Nope. I remember seeing that it was on there. I was like, oh, I need to watch this immediately. But I even mentioned this last week. So our listeners are going to be like, wow, you are trashier than I thought. I have been very busy rewatching all of the ha- Real Housewives of Orange County so that I can prepare <laughs> for an eventual new season. So I've been very busy. Lauren, you are one of the most complex people I've ever met in my entire life. I know. You're like, I, I teach no children. Sense. I love murder. And also... <laughs> I watched the I Real Housewives. The real Housewives. <laughs> I know. It's so funny because I'll go back and forth. I will watch a couple of scary shows, either a TV series or a scary movie, and then I kind of cleanse the palate with Real Housewives, and then I can move on to a true crime documentary. So it's like I just go all over the place. It's really great. That's okay. That's a full range of emotions in one day. Oh, God. I'm there. I... I can take it all in. Apparently, I don't. I don't make much sense, but I am who I am. Uh, one other thing I wanted to bring up, and I know guys that we're you know 
we need to get to our subject at some point today. But did you see Saturday Night Live at home? Yes, wow. I did. I I loved that they did that. That made me so happy. It was such a special episode, and just like any other SNL episode, like some of the sketches were total duds. Some yeah, were very course. funny, and some were kind of like, oh, fine. Yeah, I <laughs> okay. I really loved it. Even though, yeah, like you said, some of the skits were total duds, but I just loved seeing them again, and I loved that they put the effort into making something in their homes and their apartments and putting it out for us because we needed it. We've been missing them. Yeah. We needed some SNL in our lives, I... and we got to see Tom Hanks, America's True. dad. True, America's so favorite great. dad was the host, uh, Chris Martin, who I'm not a huge fan of anymore, but he did a beautiful Bob yeah. Dylan song. Um, yes, and, was uh, it was just really wonderful seeing them all like in their homes and like a lot of them had like their family help out yes, with the videos really and like just seeing their own like kind of creativity. Cause you know, they came up with their own shit. It's not like, yeah, they all no had to make there. their own sketch. Um, so it was really nice. I thought it was really cool. And I also, it kind of felt like I'm watching something that I m- may never see again. Totally. I I loved that we're going to look back on this in history and say, remember when we were in a freaking global pandemic? Remember when SNL had to do an episode from their homes? From their home. And it was, yeah, these little home recorded, very special, what felt very personal um, little sketches I thought was so very cool. And I think we'll always look back on this fondly. And it was it was very special. Everyone go watch Everyone it. go watch it. And if you're like, I don't like SNL, let me dangle this carrot in front of you. There is one of the best Carol Baskins impressions I've ever seen in my entire life. Hell yes. <laughs> and shout out to her being a new cast member and she does some of the best impersonations. That was one of my favorite seen. sketches was hers. I loved her Timothy Chalamet too. Yeah. I was laughing so hard. <laughs> it was really good. Anyways, uh, okay. hi guys. Enough shout outs. We're, Let's uh... jump into some creatures. <laughs> We're talking about <laughs> mythological creatures today. And before we start today's episode, I just want to say that we both we both did research on every single creature using multiple sources. And each of these creatures has a million different origin stories, legends, lore, different cultures that believe in something similar, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if you have a cool anecdote that you'd like to send us, please do. We love them. But if you want to yeah. correct us on something, please don't. <laughs> yeah just leave us just alone stop. There. we did our research <laughs> it's more more than likely that you learn something different about these creatures at some point in time no one is right no one is wrong don't be that guy i agree and even like in some of my research i'm mentioning like a couple of the different origins because there's just no way around it it's like hey there were four different things that could be true about this but you might know a fifth or a sixth don't write in and tell me that I was wrong. <laughs> Just let it be. I'm always happy to hear people like, hey, did you know that this, this, and that? It's like, holy shit, I didn't know that. But if it's like, um, actually, it's like, don't um, actually me. You have no idea how much research I put into this show. Like, yeah, I guarantee 100%. I saw what you have to say and I chose to omit it. Right. And it, yeah, it varies from culture to culture from yeah. timeline to timeline so just let us say what we're gonna say you also you have no Anywho. idea if this is a mandela effect situation and my timeline <laughs> is different Ooh, than very yours true. you are in a totally different timeline and you experience something we did not exactly mm, get it so i'm gonna start out today with some badass bitches called sirens Yay, I'm so excited. (laughs) Sirens, like a lot of mythological creatures, were part of Greek lore. Here we are, we're in Greece. Hello, Greece. Many cultures around the world have their myths and legends about the sea, but the ancient Grecians were pretty not okay with the sea. (laughs) They did not not like the sea. They saw the sea as a super dangerous place filled with water spirits that preyed on men. And basically, you know, the Phoenicians were... The first, the Phoenicians and the Greeks, they were the first like seafaring people. They were the first people to sail. And I guarantee their boats were shit. So, (laughs) like, (laughs) it's a scary place out there. So, um, they got eaten alive. Exactly. Greeks' belief in mermaids sort of mixed with their allure of the unknown, the danger of the sea, and the sexual attraction of beautiful ladies. And they all blended it into one special creature known as the siren. Now, A lot of people, when they think of sirens, think of naked women or mermaids. But what you really should be envisioning are birds. Oh, what? Yeah. I didn't. I actually did not know this. I mean, I did. Like, after I did my research, I was like, oh, yeah, fuck. I knew that at one point. But (laughs) 
So the OG Greek sirens are actually depicted as birds, like full on birds with the heads of women. Nope. I have never heard that (laughs) in my entire life. Oh my God. I will show you a picture. It's wild. Later depictions were almost creepier because they were the top half of the woman, but the legs and the tail of the bird. So <laughs> that sounds awful. Seriously, they're like literally just pigeons with a lady's head. So keep your pants That's on, fellas. <laughs> like they're not like pretty at all. I think the reason we're more apt to view them as beautiful naked women is because sirens are mostly heard and not seen. Because when they were right. seen, men usually didn't live to talk about it. You heard that siren come in, it was game over. Exactly. So sirens would rest on the shores of the oceans. They would rest on the cliffs of islands just out of sight. And they would sing what men would describe as songs of love or sometimes even play like string instruments. And men who heard the songs would become mesmerized and would either sail straight for the rocks only to capsize their ship or they would leave their boats, swim or walk towards them only to drown or drown, drown. That was a very like third grade like I he drowned. (laughs) <laughs> he drowned to drown or according to some legends be eaten alive like some people think or some you know some forms of the legends are that sirens were actually cannibals that would eat them yeah. which is totally awesome yeah really cool. <laughs> really cool really into it the most famous siren story probably the one that we all know best is straight out of homer's the odyssey odysseus or I, ulysses i guess is what we call him was warned by Circe about the sirens before he took off on his journey. So he was ready for them. And he made all of his men fill their ears with wax so they wouldn't be able to be seduced by the women singing. But Ulysses wanted desperately to hear the siren song, so he did not put wax in his ears, and he had his men tie him tightly to the mast of the ship. And they managed to get out alive because none of the men were phased, and old Ulysses was strapped to the ship's mast, which... Probably wasn't the only ship's mast, if you know what I'm right. saying. I get it. <laughs> Do you guys get it? No, right. I'm just kidding. Actually, Homer actually <laughs> wrote sirens a little bit differently, in my opinion, somewhat more interestingly. Okay. As in, it didn't just feature like horny dudes. Yeah. So, which, yeah, thank God. Let's change it up. I know, because, you know, most of it is, uh, you know, they sing these songs, these beautiful women sing these beautiful songs, and the men are just so horny they have to go after them, but... Right. <laughs> We're sick of that story. I'm, I'm over it. Homer wrote the sirens to appeal to men's spirits, not to men's flesh. So the siren song was actually a promise of divination or prophecies, and it was oh. hard for men to resist following the song because the sirens would sing a song about their future. Okay, so they were hearing something personal about that yeah them. so like, they oh let's hear it and and i thought it was cool because you could be standing like you and i could be standing next to each other and hear a siren song and it would be different words to the song because that's we cool. were hearing a divination of our future and to me that's just such a more interesting like rich yes. story than just like my so dick's hard and i want to go fuck this woman yeah I've been seduced by a woman's voice. No. Exactly. <laughs> if you're hearing something personal about your life, I am much more into that story. So um, the Christians, of course, managed to get their slimy hands on the legends. Yeah. And beliefs in literal sirens was discouraged, obviously. But they're still included in the scriptures. And actually, I believe they are known as jackals, according to the book of Isaiah. And they're also translated into owls in the book of Jeremiah. And they were basically allegories for worldly temptations. They were prostitutes. Mm, Okay. But I did think it was cool. Now looking back at the movie The Omen, I don't know if you remember, but Damien was the son of a jackal. Right. Which is a canine, obviously, in, in the movie, in the real world. But I thought it was interesting that according to the Bible, jackals are also sirens. Sirens. Yeah. That is pretty wild. Also, just side note, there is a new documentary series on Shudder called Cursed Films. Mm -hmm. Sounds up our alley. They cover, I mean, the thing is, is like you and I, we know all of it. We covered it on an episode of the show. And like listeners, if you remember the show vividly, like you'll know everything. We covered all of it. So they do like, they do Poltergeist, The Omen, The Exorcist, The Crow, and Twilight Zone, the movie. Okay. That is a lot of what we covered. Yeah, pretty much everything but Twilight Zone, I think. 
right? maybe we some of the that. crow, but um, they cover all of them and each one's half an hour. I will say that most of each episode is really interesting. And then they do some like weird shit that I don't understand. Like, I'll just give you an example. So for the Exorcist episode, hearing about like the things that happen on set, super fascinating. And hearing the people that like worked on the sets and stuff, super fascinating. And then all of a sudden they decide to follow an, a real exorcist. Mm-hmm. And it kind of, I completely lost interest. So it just sort of went off the rails and they're like, let's look at an actual exorcist. You can connect to the movie, but it probably didn't connect at all. Well, I think that the what they were trying to say is that because of movies like The Exorcist, specific, like, I mean, all exorcism movies that we have today took what they do from The Exorcist. Right. You know what I mean? Like every exorcism movie you see took from The Exorcist in the 70s. Right. And I think that what they're trying to say is that they influence people so much that when you see an actual exorcism, which you do in this episode, you're seeing things these people have seen these movies. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily authentic. And it's not that these people are lying um, or they're faking it. They might actually really believe it's real and they might not be faking it. But somewhere deep in their minds and in their psyches, they know these films. Yeah, for sure. So it's sort of like false memory syndrome where you get like you all of a sudden have like all these false memories. This happened a lot. I think it was back in the 60s when like mental institutions were studying multiple personality disorder. There were people who were saying like they remember their parents like doing these like sexual rituals to them and they really, truly, truly did. But it never happened. That's so interesting. So I wonder if If this is an occasion of false memory. False memory, basically, sort of influencing them. Right. That could totally be. Anyways, sirens. Um, (laughs) So sirens. (laughs) So sirens. Let's get back in. So as for the truth, unfortunately, sirens probably didn't exist, much like many legends of the dangers of the sea. People made up all kinds of things to explain why their loved ones were taken from them. Like I said earlier, the Phoenicians and the Greeks were the first people to travel by sea. And to be honest, their boats weren't that awesome. So a lot, a lot of Greeks died at sea. And their families, you know, it wasn't a shipwreck. It had to be something mystical that forced the shipwreck to happen. It's like a Um, coping mechanism. It is. I have to know that something attacked the ship. Something happened. Like that was out of our control. And I have no doubt that the Greeks believed in sirens, and they probably heard and saw them too. But like I said, sirens were birds, and birds sing. So it, I don't think, you know, that, that they were making it up, but they really, really believed that, that uh, this was happening, and, and the people back home did whatever they could to cope with the fact that, that their loved ones died. And, yeah, you know, I sit here saying that, and I'm like, sirens aren't real because of this, that, and the other, but... I also am someone who believes in the paranormal and Mm -hmm. there are a lot of people today who say that that is a coping mechanism when it comes to death. Absolutely. That it's just something that I use that makes me feel better about the fact that I'm going to die and that my loved ones died Mm -hmm. and it helps you get through it. But I've seen ghosts. Yes. So like you've uh, had experiences with the dead yeah. so so it, maybe i don't know yeah. maybe sirens were fucking real i don't know but right. I, it definitely seems like it was a way to sort of explain why they lost so many men yeah absolutely i i don't want to doubt that anybody saw a siren maybe they did i have no idea like you have seen a girl in like a sunflower dress or whatever the hell she was wearing sitting in a closet in your house when you were little so like Who's to say what you can see in the world? But it does seem like it's more of a coping mechanism to just say, well, this creature who was out at sea definitely is what took them under because it couldn't just be that their boat fell apart because it was built terribly. Yeah. (sighs) And a lot of old legends and old mythology is that is is explaining things that they don't have explanations for. 
Right. So, you know, there's no explanation for like why the sun rises. So there's obviously a god that allows the sun to rise. Everything connects to the gods and the goddesses. Exactly. Taking care of everything for us. Yeah, it's so So, true. But who knows? What do we fucking know? We don't know anything. We we don't know nothing. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Speaking of which, I don't I didn't know nothing about banshees. I'm gonna talk about banshees. We're heading to Ireland now. We're gonna go back to Greece. Don't you worry, guys. We're headed guys, back we're to not Greece done later. With Greece. But we're going to Ireland for now. And it's actually a lie that I said I don't know nothing about banshees because I told Ashley this earlier in the week when I was in fourth grade, I did a report on banshees and I scared my entire class to death. <laughs> Everybody was looking at me like a deer in headlights, the biggest eyes, jaws on their desks. Everybody hated me because they couldn't believe that a little eight, eight and a half year old was talking about screaming banshees from Ireland. (laughs) I terrified everybody. And I also wrote, I remembered this too, after I talked to you in seventh grade, I wrote a fictional story about banshees and got an A on it. And my teacher was like, this is so compelling. This is so good. He gave me all the compliments and I'm not... Just even trying to pat myself on the back because I wasn't necessarily and still am not to this day the best writer in the world. And I'm kind of a dummy, but I wrote well when it came to the paranormal <laughs> and banshees. Things that you apparently. were interested in. Yeah. Yes, because I had a passion for them, especially, yeah, anytime I had to write a paper about musicals or musical theater, it was the same thing. So anyway, banshees have been in my life <laughs> If you had ever gone to Holiday World, which I now remember and will never forget that you have not. Oh, I'm so sad I haven't. There is a ride in the Halloween part, like Halloween land, that is, I I don't know if it's called the Banshee or the Screaming Banshee, but it fucking rules. Oh my gosh, I bet it's amazing. I have to ride it before I die. Is <laughs> Wait, is Holiday World still open? I think so. I don't know. I mean, I'm pretty sure. Okay, well, we're going to have to pay it a visit. We're going to save up all of our Patreon money. <laughs> dollars and cents. And That's what your world. money is going towards. Trips to uh, the holiday world. Don't you love it, listeners? Okay, Banshees. We're headed to Ireland. So the Banshee is a female spirit and is considered to be a sign or an omen of death approaching. The Banshee roams the Irish countryside and can be heard wailing or screaming. It's what everyone kind of associates with the Banshee. I'm sure that's what all of our listeners are thinking. The wail or the scream of the Banshee is what predicts a death. So the word Banshee comes from the Irish term Beanshee, which is, yeah, pronounced just like that. It's like Beanshee, which translates (laughs) to woman of the fairy mounds or woman of the mounds. Oh, okay. So some people say that a banshee is a fairy, which Ashley is going to talk about fairies later, but a lot of people just refer to her as a spirit or a ghost. Um, But the reason she got the term woman of the fairy mounds or woman of the mounds is because people always claimed that they saw banshees, these female spirits, hanging around these mounds of dirt that would go all along the Irish countryside um, in the old world, and they the mounds were graves of noblemen, old Irish noblemen, and so that became known that she was the woman crying over people's graves, mourning the dead. So that's kind of how she became attached to the dead. People always claimed they saw a woman crying over these graves. So banshees actually aren't bad spirits. They have good intentions, but they are always depicted as these crazy ghoulish looking creatures. They don't look friendly. They look horrifying in all of the drawings that we see or in horror movies on Halloween, whatever. They usually appear as withered old hags. They have red glowing eyes. They have long, um, usually reddish hair that's flowing. It almost like flies up in the air, sort of like Medusa. It kind of looks like the snake hair, but it's all just hair flying up. And um, usually it's said that the hair shimmers like wildfire. Whoa. One thing I was going to say is it's the same sort of in like Greek mythology. You know, you think of like Hades. Hades is always represented in like, uh, you know, in um, modern cultures as like bad. But Hades just like someone had to rule the underworld. You know what I mean? Like someone had to do it. it. He wasn't bad. It was a job. He got paid. (laughs) But like it wasn't necessarily like he wasn't bad. He didn't kill people. But what he did was he took the souls that needed to, you know passed through the underworld and he was the one that ushered them in like he didn't do exactly. anything um, he's looked so bad it looked like yeah he's, he's always he's always depicted as like an evil person like almost like a right. devil but it's like no he just kind of like that was his job 
Yeah, he had to go to work, you know. <laughs> you gotta get paid. <laughs> it's very true. And that's kind of how the Banshee was. Um, She had to do with death and she was around whenever someone died, but she wasn't the Grim Reaper. You know, Banshees weren't taking Even the Grim Reaper. Life. Someone's know, gotta do it. The Grim it. Reaper, it was the job and <laughs> little Grimmy had to show up <laughs> no matter what. And Banshees were more of just a warning that a death was about to happen, but they weren't actually doing the killing. So it's kind of sad that they always have this horrible ghoulish eerie look um there's also a scottish version of the banshee called the benai um which are identified with a few unusual signs we're not talking about the scottish version as much but i just wanted to touch on it because it made me giggle the scottish benai uh is depicted as a woman with drooping breasts oh. one nostril no. and feet webbed like a duck <laughs> oh my god so uh what happened, Scott? Well, I know Where, why. What happened to this lady? I know why she's screaming. <laughs> she's like, exactly. I can't believe I look like this. I can't breathe. I have one nostril. I can barely walk with these webbed feet. Yeah, so the Scottish version just really made me giggle. Um, whereas the Irish version, even though depicted a little ghoulish, it still looks like, for the most part, a good looking woman. It just has like the crazy hair, the red eyes that are red from weeping over the dead like there's the scary parts to it but you can still tell it's a woman whereas the scottish version freaks me out a little bit but anyway back to ireland banshees may seem evil at first sight but as i said there's actually no record of them being violent in any of the stories or even really being mischievous in any way they just hang around when death is happening and they're almost like guardians of a family but they're not ever causing the death so their dark appearances are believed to come out of their tragic history in their own lives. Many people believe that banshees are the spirits of women who were murdered or else they died during childbirth. So they believe that these are women who had some sort of very traumatic death and they came out to then watch over the children of other families um, and watch them from birth until the end of their life. Wow. Others believe that they are a type of fairy, as I mentioned before, and it was a fairy that was driven away to live underground once the arrival of humans happened. So any way you take the story, they were somehow taken out of their happy, normal life in a tragic way. So with their sad history, it's not surprising that Banshees are hypersensitive to sadness in other people's lives. Um, and it makes sense that their grief has taken on some sort of supernatural form. So banshees, what they're great for is they have loyalty and devotion. They okay. will serve a specific family and they'll spend centuries watching over the children of that family. And they're devoted to their country, Ireland, and they attach themselves to only families who are direct descendants of Celts, not Normans or Saxons. So I guess they're a little sassy with who they pick to follow. <laughs> they're only... <laughs> following those celtic families like the originals but they love ireland and they stick with those families and also banshees usually are attracted to wealth and nobility like i was mentioning earlier they were you know the women of the mounds they were hanging around those mounds that were usually noblemen buried so some legends claim that they only serve the ancient celtic noble families which were the o'neills the o'briens the o'connors the o'grady's and the kavanaugh's so basically if you have so o conan o'brien <laughs> Conan O'Brien, he's good to go. He's being watched by a banshee every night. Um, or if you have a Mac in front of your name, a lot of those families too. Basically, any stereotypical Irish name, you'll be good to go with your banshees. Um, others claim that before the death of a very important leader, multiple banshees will come together in mourning and you will hear multiple screams. Um, so you really can't just be a Bob Smith or a Joe, whatever his name, if you want a banshee to follow you and be your guardian and give out a nice wail when you die. You can't be an average Joe. You're not living your most fabulous life if you don't have a banshee. <laughs> That's basically what I've learned. <laughs> Um, some special abilities of banshees, they're best known for their premonitions. They always appear shortly before the death of someone in their designated family. And in a few stories, they've actually spoken out to tell exactly who would die and how, but this isn't the most common occurrence uh, in the different stories and versions that you'll read. In most, sim in most cases, they will simply wail or do their piercing scream, and it, that is the powerful message that someone is going to die soon. And it can be heard for miles and miles, and it will chill the hearts of anyone Jesus. who hears it. 
It's a piercing cry, and some stories have even described glass windows shattering by the high note of the banshee's scream. <laughs> Going back to the bee nigh for a second from Scotland, our old our old bitch. She has a slightly <laughs> different way of sending her message. Oh, I I'm just sure like to she touch does because they're funny. <laughs> she appears by a river, washing bloody clothes of armor in the water, yeah. and she will look you in the eye and tell you every specific detail about how you are going to die while she washes your bloody clothes. Good lord! So the the squat the squattish. The Scottish Banshee, or Benai, is a bit of a trashy witch, I would say. <laughs> she's she's really, you know, she's marching to the beat of her own drummer. I guess you gotta respect it. But that's her. So, before there were actual Banshees wandering the hills of Ireland, to go back just a little bit, um, there were real women who actually did this job. Have you heard of Keeners before? I don't think so. I I feel like I saw them in a movie once, and I, but I, they had been called like the screaming women or something. But there is a term called keeners or wailing women who used to be hired to grieve at a funeral or outside of a house where someone was expected to die. Wow. And their wailing songs inspired other people to grieve for the dead as well and send their well wishes. Um, it was a way to call the people of Ireland to all grieve together and honor the dead or the dying. So historical records show that keeners were active around the 8th century, and then sometime around the 10th century, they died out and their popularity faded, but their legend lived on in the form of banshees. So again, the people of Ireland, I think, looking for a way to carry on that tradition, even though these women weren't being hired anymore to literally wail and scream at funerals, which I cannot believe is a job. They started to believe in these banshees, that the cry and the wail was carrying on and that people were still being honored or that people still had some sort of guardian watching over the family when death was near. So people started to bring up the story of the banshee and that they would hear the cries or sometimes even see these women, maybe because they were looking for a way to cope, as we discussed before, or possibly there were real grieving spirit women that were appearing so by the 14th century banshee lore was in full swing it had grown so much and they are found in irish scottish and norman literature all during that century we're finding writings of them and by the 15th century belief in banshees was so right widespread that king james the first of scotland even reported encountering one of them um, for a few of his family members. So Banshees became basically as well known as the Leprechaun when you're looking back at Irish lore. They are a huge part of Ireland and they're just sort of, you know, the creepy, ghosty death cousin of Leprechauns <laughs> that are hanging out in Ireland. <laughs> and Banshees are still well known today. Um, they're probably going to pop up on, Hall- on Halloween every now and then. You know, we have our ghosts and our witches and all of our normal creepy things. And every once in a while, you'll see a banshee. And I think I even wanted to be a banshee one Halloween. It was probably the same year I wrote that special paper. And my mom was like, can you please just reuse a costume yeah, can I already we not? had? And I, I was, don't feel like... <laughs> I, d- I don't want to make a banshee. I so also I don't want to hear you scream all night. Oh, and you know that's what I would have done. I just would have found an excuse to scream as loud as I could as a child. So I did not get to be a banshee, and I think I was a witch for the 90th time. But um, you sometimes see them pop up at Halloween parties and haunted houses, which is cool. And um, if you're looking for them in pop culture, little shout out, they've been in Scooby-Doo. Hell yeah. The trashy show Teen Wolf on MTV. Hell yeah. And a couple garbage made for TV movies titled Banshee and Scream of the Banshee that I do not recommend. (laughs) And that (laughs) is my (laughs) spiel on Banshee movies. To wrap that up. Well, I'm, I'm not ready to wrap it up because as you were talking, I was working something out in my head. So banshees oh are an omen of death, right? They're omens. Yeah. They have red eyes. They're not uh-huh. trying to stop death. They're just warning of death. And they, they have to do right. with premonitions. Um, you know, who would die and how? Who does that sound like? The the omen? Um, No. That is a movie about the Antichrist. (laughs) Oh, wait. Are we talking about a real thing? Yeah, Lauren. A a Mothman. Oh, my God. It is. Oh. It's all the same thing. Yeah. I mean, you know, Indrid Cold. Cold. Like, the red eyes. It's a premonition of death. Like, it knew exactly who was going to die, how they were going to die, and when they were going to die. But it wasn't there to try and stop them. 
Right. It was warning and it was literally spelling out exactly what was going to happen in its yeah. own kind of special code. And I thought we were talking about pop culture still. Oh, I was still sorry, thinking sorry, about sorry, Scooby sorry. Doo. No. So I'm sorry. I was like, the movie The Omen? The oh my Omen? God. It's Is literally we... interesting. Yeah. Ashley, that's creepy. And also, there were reports of like loud piercing sounds and like strange lights. Like, it wasn't just, that is true. yeah, it wasn't just, you know, a creepy moth man. I think of Banshees every single time I think of the Halloween decorations that just scream. Like, you know what I mean? That yes. you like push their hand and they're like, ah! Exactly. Like, well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's literally it. That's Banshee. Hello. <laughs> they're just screaming their dang heads off all day long. That is correct. Well, um, I love it. And now, uh, so, so, so many listeners have suggested that we chat oh my gosh, yes. about a mermaids. Mermaids, we're finally doing it. <laughs> so I'm going to do so. Uh, you know, I already talked about sirens, which were half women, half bird. So let's talk about the creatures that are half woman, half fish. But wait one hey. second. The first mer person in history was actually a mer dude. <gasps> Merman. Merman. I it, love it. First uh, mer anything was a mer man. I'm into it. And it was about 4,000 years ago. Um, it was the first oh, recorded geez. merman. Of course, who knows what happened before the written word, but the first recorded sure. merman was the Babylonian god of the sea. And okay. uh, he would actually later, uh, you know, we talked about earlier how like, oh, I don't know if America has any original like mythological creatures we took from all these others. I mean, yeah. gr the Greeks and the Romans did, too, because the Babylonian god of the sea would later be co-opted by the Greeks as Poseidon and the Romans as Neptune. So even they were stealing shit. Yep, everybody's doing it. <laughs> everybody's stealing <laughs> their own creatures. Come on, baby. Steal the mythical creatures. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh my. It wasn't until <laughs> about 300 BC that we had our first mention of a mer lady, and her name was, please forgive me, Etergatis. And oh. she was an ancient Syrian goddess who actually watched over the fertility of her people. Okay. But she was lady on top, fish on bottom, and she, this is pretty cool, she had the biggest, most lush temple they could possibly make, and it was surrounded by a pond of sacred fish. Ooh, So Syrians that. really, like, she was, like, top, top god, top goddess. <laughs> she, she was on top of the world. I love that. Get it, girl. Anyway, blah, 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 blah. All these cultures had fish people. But what I find interesting is that of all the cultures that have ever had mermaids, no one can really figure out whether mermaids are good or bad after, like, after they entered European mythology. Like, obviously, these mer people were good. They, like, protected the sea. They protected the fertility of their women. But... Right. At, once they got into like European mythology and even like Greek mythology, like sometimes they are portrayed as beautiful seductresses that lonely sailors would lust over as they watched them swim around their ships. But at mm -hmm. the same time, in the same cultures, they were also snarling fish beasts who would drag men into the dark, dark depths of the sea. Yeah, so, boy. like, regardless, are they mean or are, are they, they mean? Like, like no one could, no one could like decide. Like, no one could. <laughs> Like, even then, they were like, mermaids are great or scary. We're not sure. <laughs> we can't decide. So, um, regardless of that, though, mermaids stuck around even after the Greek and Roman gods and goddesses faded into legends. Uh, mermaids made it into at least the 17th century. Okay. But again, conflicting reports. <laughs> like right. everybody's telling a different no one story. knows if they like them or they hate them um 16th yeah. century scandinavian fishermen believe that if you reeled in or netted a mermaid or a merman and didn't let them go right away you were fucked like oh, horrible luck fucked not that they themselves would kill you just that like you would have bad luck for the rest of your trip or possibly the rest of your life if you didn't let them go immediately yeah um, okay. mermaids were actually terribly bad luck to snag, reel in, or even see. Like, you didn't even want to see a mermaid. Like, that was a bad oh. omen. Oh, cool. Great. Now, this next story, like, I'm not sure if this was part of the inspiration for The Little Mermaid, which was written by Hans Christian Andersen, and is, like, 
an incredibly dark story. Um, it's so dark. I'll, I'm actually, I was going to say, I'm actually so at the dark. end of this, I'm going to talk about The Little Mermaid and the differences between the Disney version and the real version because I think that's so fascinating. It is. We're going to break some hearts, but you need to know. You need to know about it. Anyway, the story uh, Little Mermaid was written in 1837, but there are historical records of a legend dating back to, I think, 1430. In the Netherlands, where two girls were rowing around in a boat after a really bad storm, and they found a woman floundering in the shallow, muddy waters. And they got her into the boat, they took her home, and they dressed her in women's clothes. But for the rest of her life, they could never teach her how to speak. She remained totally mute for the rest of her days. And uh, the girls and her families and the people in the town believed that she was a mermaid. Like, she had legs. She didn't have fish bottom, but they just believed that since they found her in the water and she could never tell them who th- she was, they believed her to be a mermaid. Because her voice was taken by Ursula, yes. obviously. <laughs> the sea witch. Why don't they get it? Why can't anyone understand? <laughs> so modern-ish mermaid sightings exploded once the age of exploration began because men in huge boats were making their way all around the world via the sea. Mm. Actually, John Smith, like John Smith from Pocahontas, um, which is not an accurate movie at all, John Smith no, no, no. <laughs> caught sight uh, of one off of the coast of Newfoundland in 1614. And he said, quote, her long green hair imparted to her an original character that was by no means unattractive. So basically, girl can get it. Like he was into <laughs> girl it. Can get it. She was looking real fine. Real fine. He liked what he saw. <laughs> but then Christopher Columbus actually wrote about mermaids in 1493 near what is now today the Dominican Republic. He, however, did not think the mermaid could get it. <laughs> like he was not impressed. <laughs> How rude. He said that he saw three mermaids who came quite high out of the water, but were, quote, not as pretty as they were depicted, for somehow in the face they look like men, which, like, oh, that's some, like, mad toxic masculinity energy right there, that, Christopher Columbus. We don't need that. Like, no. That is... So rude to all women. Super rude. I'm sorry if maybe they had a little bit of a jawline and it wasn't what you were into. <laughs> a wide nose, Let you piece be. of shit. <laughs> but you know what? Here's the thing. I'm sure right after he shut his diary, he went right back to murdering and enslaving. <laughs> so You're exactly right, I'm sure Ashley. the ugly mermaids busy. were forgotten pretty quickly. He was busy with some ugly acts of violence. Raping and pillaging. Busy. Most people believe what all these mermaid sightings are, are actually manatee sightings, which when you look at a manatee, you're like, what? Excuse me, a manatee don't look like a mer person. But after I like read more about it and like looked up some videos, I totally get it because manatees rise out of the water like a person would like head first straight up. They don't rise out of the water like a whale would, where it's like a a motion. They go like straight up out of the water. And uh, even like in shallow water, like maybe towards the, you know, especially if you're in a boat and you can just see the shore, manatees will do, um, they do what they, what people call tail stands, where they essentially stand on their tails. So they can just prop themselves up out of the water and be upright. And also, okay. when they are observed from a distance, they're easily mistaken for humans because their neck vertebrae is like ours, and it enables them to turn their heads exactly like we do. Oh, wow. A little creepy, but now kind of I creepy. understand more <laughs> and what people are saying. Also, if you look, their limbs, they have five sets of finger-like bones, which, when submerged in water, could look like webbed human hands. So, like, say you just see the hand or you just see, you know what I mean? Like, there are several reasons why people could see a manatee and think, oh, my God, that's a man or a woman or a person. Right. That Yeah, that makes sense. So, also, manatees have existed literally for 24 million freaking years. So, (laughs) they are like the dinosaurs. They've gotten around. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that does make sense. So maybe we were just seeing manatees. Also, I think it was the beluga whale. If you look at a beluga whale from the underbelly, it mm-hmm. looks like two human legs. Like, they obviously have a fin, 
but going into the fin looks like two human legs underneath the skin of the whale. It's kind of creepy if you look at it, but oh, weird. maybe if someone saw I'm that from underneath, going to yeah, photos. it's kind of like Google underneath a beluga whale. <laughs> Alex is going to be like, what, what are, are you doing? looking up? I'm, Please don't I'm look up weird stuff on my computer. I've told you so many <laughs> times. It's my work computer. My boss is asking questions and he needs to know what, what you're into. <laughs> so oh, before I wrap up the mermaid stuff, um, very quickly, for those of you who want to hear more about the real Little Mermaid, which is a lot darker, but despite what most people believe, this story has a very beautiful ending. So um, we all know the Disney version. So just imagine that. But then I'll tell you where there are changes for the sake of time. I won't go from. Actually, you know what? I'm going to read it to you. Once there was a Little Mermaid. Just kidding. So <laughs> tell the whole story. Uh, first of all, the Little Mermaid's voice is not taken. It, her voice is taken, but also her tongue is cut out by the sea witch, which is already oh, like that. yikes. And uh, she is given a potion to drink that will give her that will take her voice and give her human legs. But what's not mentioned in the movie is that it will feel like daggers stabbing her feet with every step, like forever, for her entire cool, life. Cool, cool, cool. Who would ever choose that? I know. I would. Well, here's the like, thing. Do you want to walk on the earth that badly? Yes, she did because it, you know, in in the Little Mermaid. Ariel wants to be a human because she wants to marry the prince because she saw a prince and she wants she loves him immediately, which is a very yeah, yeah. Disney Eric's thing hot. to do. We get it. But yes. in the story, it's actually much more special. So, Elim, that's what I'm gonna call her because she's not called Ariel in the uh, story. Right. She's just the Little Mermaid. Elim goes to her grandma and asks if humans can live forever. And her granny explains that humans have a much shorter lifespan than mermaids, who live to be about 300 years old. But that when mermaids die, they turn into sea foam and they cease to exist. They're just done. Mm -hmm. But when humans die, they have an eternal soul that will live on in heaven. So the Little Mermaid's motives weren't just to, like, marry a prince. She wanted an eternal soul. She wanted eternal life. Yeah, she okay. wanted a soul and she wanted sense. to, like, have... Uh, you know, she wanted to go to heaven, which is like, oh, my God, yeah. that's a much better reason to leave your 100%. leave your family for the rest of your life. And I like, can get on board yeah. with that rather than just Prince Eric was looking real, real cute, smoking hot one day. Yeah. So anyways, tongues cut out. She drinks a potion, which feels like a sword stabbing in her chest. She gets legs. Um, She washes up. She's naked on Prince Eric's porch. And also, oh, yeah, if the prince marries someone else the day after, Little Mermaid will die of a broken heart and dissolve into sea foam. Like, it's not just like she'll never get her voice back and she'll turn into a mermaid. No, she will literally die if he gets she married. She just turns into sea foam, which. So ugh. the prince it's just does so marry someone else. He actually. What a piece of shit. He marries the woman. Well, listen, this girl can't talk and she has no tongue. Like, I get it. <laughs> Um, oh, he fine. actually marries the woman that he believes saved him when he almost drowned, even though it wasn't her. It was L.M., but she can't tell him that because she has no tongue or no voice. Oh, my gosh. This story is getting more and more depressing. It's so and sad. I hate it. So he marries this woman that he believes saved her. And of course, she doesn't fucking speak up because she wants to marry this prince. And on the night of the wedding, after the wedding's already over, so Little Mermaid knows she's dying tomorrow. The Little Mermaid's sister brings her a dagger. That they supposedly got from the sea witch in exchange for all their hair, so they're bald. Perfect. And they tell her Just that keep adding on. <laughs> to keep adding on, keep adding on the sad. They tell her that if she kills the prince and lets his blood drip on her feet, she will become a mermaid again, and then she'll get to go live the rest of her life. So two hundred eighty-five years in the ocean with her family. So she takes the dagger, but she ends up. Little Mermaid cannot bring herself to do it, so she throws herself off the ship. Just as dawn breaks and she dissolves into sea foam. It's it's the most upsetting story I've but ever heard in my life. I that's not where it. the story ends. That's where a lot of people think what? the story ends. They think yeah, the story ends with I her dissolving into sea foam. She turned into sea foam. She does. <gasps> what? But instead of ceasing to exist, she feels the warm sun and finds that she is turned into an earthbound spirit. 
and she ascends into the atmosphere and she's greeted by all the other daughters of the air who tell her that because she strove so hard to obtain a soul and that she didn't take another's life to do so, she is given the chance to earn her soul by doing good deeds for mankind for 300 years and then she'll get to go to heaven. Oh my gosh. So the story's super dark, but I always see everyone saying the real ending to Little Mermaid. She dissolves in the sea foam and dies, but no one ever mentions that she gets yeah. what she always wanted, which is a soul and everlasting life. So all she has to do is good deeds, and she gets which what she, she wanted, gladly which she gladly will because yeah, of course she's going not? to do it. And she already seems like a very selfless woman because she already took her own life instead of stabbing the prince and getting what she wanted so she already seems really lovely yeah because it's not like the prince was anything fucking special at this point so it's like oh stab this nobody who totally like did you wrong and you get to right. live your life or die a painful death and she's like well i guess i'll die a painful death because i can't kill him yeah right because i can't bring myself to do it which is a good hearted so she gets woman, to go to heaven so i'm very into it Okay, that is a much better ending. It has always ended on the foam part for me, and I was so depressed, and I was really mad at you for bringing it up and upsetting <laughs> me again, so thank you for showing me the better ending. Ugh. Thank goodness. You know, I needed that. I needed that today. I needed a win. <laughs> I needed a win today. It's been so hard. <laughs> it really wasn't that hard of a day. I was just frustrated with my child, but that made me really happy. You changed my whole outlook on the Little Mermaid. Please don't ever give me your son and tell me to like show him a movie because I will show him the Little Mermaid and be like, you know what happens in the story? <laughs> and be like, she gets her to tongue cut wilder. out. <laughs> her tongue gets cut out. She has to walk the land, feeling like she's walking on daggers. Like you're just gonna. <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna be like, this is fucked up. Why does my mom let me hang out with you? <laughs> or you're just showing him the truth, just, which you I know appreciate because kids need to know the truth sometimes. They do. And we've already talked about how Wilder could go either way with his genetics. He could hate scary movies or love them because his mother and his father are very different in that regard. So I kind of want him to see the dark side of things and hopefully be a dark, twisted soul like his mother. Well, I'll do my best. Yeah, you have to help me out. You have to be the creepy aunt. <laughs> That's your job. That's all the time we have this week for Keep It Weird. Thank you so much for continuing to choose to listen to our show. We know that you have a radically different schedule right now, and everyone has been thrown a curveball no matter what your situation is. But our downloads are strong, and you guys are still chatting with us and supporting us on social media and our Patreon and our Etsy store, and we just really... Really love you, and we want everything good in the world for you. We appreciate you guys so much. You don't even know. You're keeping up so much hope and joy in our lives in this really tough time. So thank you, thank you, thank you thank for being a part of this show. Um, and next week, tune in next week, because we have more mythological creatures. This is a two-part episode. A part of dos is coming your way. <laughs> so we're very excited for that. We have a contest coming up, question mark, question mark, question mark, I believe. But we're going <laughs> to actually wait till next week to announce that. So stay tuned for that. Stick with us, guys. Stick with it. Follow us on social media. So, 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 so media. So, so, so media. Follow us on social media. Uh, keep it weird, cast across all platforms check out our patreon at www.patreon.com slash keep it weird podcast to find ways that you can donate to the show and get bonus episodes and discounts on merch and a monthly newsletter and check out our etsy store at www.etsy.com slash shop slash keep it weird podcast and get yourself some of our new merch it's so 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 cool um, it's honestly the yes. best our new design is so much fun and i love all of it and i say this every time but you guys there's a baby t-shirt <laughs> yes so we can't cute. forget that there is a baby t-shirt that is one of the most important things about <laughs> our new merch oh, i just love it i love it all check it out it's so cool thank you again to brandy systrup and katie rains for designing our amazing merch um these two are brilliant artists and also very sweet and deserve the sun and the moon so you should follow them on social media as well we tag them all the time um on our instagram so we're obsessed with them and you should be too absolutely our sign off this week i think should be a very quiet because babies are sleeping a very quiet banshee scream <laughs> 
Okay. <laughs> so I'm about to die, and. That was really good. Mine was more like a, like a, almost like excited. Mine sort of sounded like a mouse that was being hurt. I'm but very surprised that Alex did not come in the room for that. I am surprised he's not barging in and slapping me across the face right now. But we are here. <laughs> Nobody woke up. We're fine. We're fine. Everything's fine. And you guys should keep it weird. Keep it weird. I can't believe I look like this.